if you're looking at these two movements, I, I want to make a stark contrast here because we had the March for Life Friday, we had the Women's March Saturday, and then we had Martin Luther King Day on Monday. And I think that you can kind of tie all these events together. There was one woman speaker, and you've already heard me mention her earlier. She was the one that was talking about how basically you can use anybody to get to heaven. You can be Muslim and go to heaven. You can be Jewish and go to heaven, which according to all of those religions' own doctrines is not true. And it's especially true in Christianity, where in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. In other words, if Jesus isn't the Savior, if Jesus isn't God, if you're not following his doctrines, sorry, you're not getting into heaven. That's the way that this works. That's consistent throughout all of the New Testament. And yet, she was saying this, and so the same woman starts talking about Martin Luther King Jr., and proceeded to advocate for a whole bunch of things that he would have never stood for. So in the same paragraph of her speech, where she was talking about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., she also talks about it's so horrible that people are transphobic and homophobic and all this sort of stuff. I don't really even necessarily agree with those monikers, but she's basically saying that homosexuality is all right, that transgenderism is all right, men dressing like women, women dressing like men. And she also goes on, and just, I mean, lets the, lets the cuss words fly and goes on to advocate for a whole bunch of things that Dr. King himself would have never approved of. I mean, you're looking at Dr. King, even though there were probably some things that I disagreed with him on, for example, his economic policies, I think were a little off. You're looking at his stance on civil rights and the stances that he took when it came to his Christianity, his faith. This was a guy that really strongly believed that we were supposed to be following the Bible as God intended it, as Jesus intended it, and, and as it was written. Not all this PC stuff where they rewrite stuff. Where they say, well, everybody's acceptable and you don't really have to repent of any of your sins. And as long as you, uh, actually, she wasn't saying whether you love Jesus or not, it's fine. It just doesn't matter what you believe. Dr. King would have never advocated for such a ridiculous stance. So I want you to, to think about this. Out of these two marches, which crowd do you believe Dr. King would have been more at home with? In other words, which crowd would he, would he more easily fit into? I'm not saying agreed with everything. I'm saying which one do you think that he would have been more likely to attend? Which group would he have felt more comfortable with and, and more like it was his own people around him? I really do want you to think about this when we're talking about this. Because Dr. Martin Luther King said, and this is a quote, so don't freak out on me, YouTube. Don't demonetize this video. I'm quoting Dr. King when I say this. The Negro cannot win if he is willing to sacrifice the futures of his children for immediate personal comfort and safety. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So Dr. King saying right there that if you are willing to sacrifice the future of your children for personal comfort and safety, then you are a bad person. He's condemning that action. And yet that's exactly what abortions are. They're saying, well, you know, having children is inconvenient and I didn't want a child, therefore I got an abortion. You know, that doesn't justify it. You're sacrificing the future of your child for your own comfort. They're saying, well, what about instances of life of the mother? So you're sacrificing the future of your children for your own safety. This goes right along with all the abortions arguments and flies in the face of them. Dr. King would have not been in favor of abortion. Now, granted, he didn't talk a lot on the subject because he lived in a time where it was illegal and it wasn't really a hot button political issue. But you have Dr. King here saying that anybody that would be doing that, he says they cannot win if they are willing to sacrifice the future of their children for comfort and safety. And you also have his niece, Alveda King, saying this, and this is a, a little bit longer, but this is an interview that took place yesterday. Dr. Alveda King, and she's one of the ones that actually led the closing prayer at the March for Life. She said this in a, a Daily Signal interview. Well, what has happened with my uncle's legacy? They forget the spiritual aspect. And so as one who civil, uh, who's also a civil rights leader for the 20th century and now the 21st century, I was there and I marched and I went to jail with those great leaders. I was a young lady, a teenage girl. However, I remember the prayer meetings and how often we came together and prayed. 
I remember that everything we did was founded on the Bible. One of my favorite songs was Paul and Silas, were bound in jail, had no money to pay their bail. Keep your eye on the prize, hold on. Of course, the prize was the love of God toward all people and the salvation of humanity. I believe that we have not given full credence to the spiritual aspect of the message of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., her words, not mine, which includes the sanctity of life, procreative message, a man and woman marrying with commitment, if God wills, to birth and raise children in a healthy manner, taking care of the least of these. All right, so you're looking at that quote. This is someone who was there on the ground when Dr. King was alive, during the movement, was a teenager at that time, saying that the whole thing was rooted in spirituality and that people have forgotten that. That people have completely ignored the fact that Dr. King was also a preacher, was also a spiritual leader. You see, now, today, most people just think of him as being a, a political activist. And he was. He was a political activist. Nobody would deny that. But he was also a spiritual leader. In fact, he was first and foremost a spiritual leader. And it takes both to really understand the man. You have to understand his political activism and his spirituality. Because his political activism came as an outgrowth of his spiritual beliefs. People act like it was the other way around, that he was using religion as a way to talk to people about political activism. No, no, no. It started as a spiritual movement and delved into the realm of politics where it was appropriate. See, the rights of human beings, the rights that are associated with being a human being are true whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're Asian or Hispanic or an unborn person. And that's the thing. The whole argument for being against abortion being pro-life is that all human life is inherently valuable, which is the same premise that Alveda King is saying started the civil rights movement. The idea that we have a responsibility as creations of God to stand up for other people that are not able to stand up for themselves and are having their rights violated, the rights that were given to them by God, that we're not treating our brothers and sisters the way that we're supposed to. That's the argument that King was making back then, and it's the argument that the pro-life people are making now. And that's the correlation that Dr. King, and when I say that I mean Dr. Alveda King, is seeing between that civil rights movement, which she was a part of, and the civil rights movement now of abortion and fighting against that great evil. Now, here's another thing I want you to consider. If you're going back to Dr. King and you know anything about history, to be in his group, you had to sign an oath. You had to sign an oath just to be able to participate in protest with his group. And I'm going to read you, because there were 10 planks, and I'm going to read you a part of it. I hereby pledge myself, my person and body, to the nonviolent movement. Therefore, I will keep following the Ten Commandments. One, meditate daily on the teachings and life of Jesus Christ. That's number one. In other words, you cannot be a member of Dr. King's group back in the 1960s unless the very first thing that you agree to is I am going to meditate daily on the teachings and the life of Jesus. Think about how significant that is. If you're not somebody that reads the scripture and thinks about it and contemplates that, you're not allowed to even be part of our group. Let's look at plank number three. Walk and talk in the manner of love, for God is love. So, because God is love, we're supposed to talk and walk in the manner of love in everything that we do. All right, let's look at number four. Pray daily to be used by God in order that all men might be free. So, unless you pray to God on a daily basis to be a part of God's will that everybody would be free. So unless you believe that your goal is God-oriented, that it is God or has ordained this, the thing that you're fighting for, the freedom of all mankind, is something that God specifically wants to be in place, and unless you're praying to him daily to help out with that, 
then you're also not allowed to be in Dr. King's group. And let's skip down to number nine. Strive to be in good spiritual and bodily health. So in other words, you have to be worried about how your spirit is doing, how your spiritual health is, if you're going to be a part of this group. And you had to take this oath. Every single person that was a member of his group had to take it. And by the way, the name of that movement was the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. If the left saw this today, they'd say, this man's a religious zealot. He's a bigot. He doesn't want people that aren't Christians and don't believe the things that he believes as a member of his group. In fact, the Democrats were the ones that were opposing Dr. King back in the 1960s. But what I'm saying here is, if you were looking at this pledge today, there would be Democrats that are saying, this guy's some religious fanatic. Everything he does is based in the scripture. And unless you're a Christian, you're not even allowed to be part of his group. Yeah, that's who Dr. King was. That's how seriously he took it. And so this idea that he was not a spiritual leader and to ignore that aspect of his life is being completely disingenuous to his legacy. And if you don't believe me when I say that this is how they would go after Dr. Martin Luther King today, look at how the left just reacted to Karen Pence. For Karen Pence signing a pledge saying that she will subscribe to the biblical view of uh, morality, sexuality, marriage, all these things. I mean, that was the part that they focused on, but it's just sort of a general pledge that you will uphold Christian principles. They're saying that she's a religious bigot and that her husband should not be allowed to continue to be the vice president because of this. Yeah, well, Dr. King made people take essentially exactly the same oath. The same thing. So if you don't believe me when I say that the left would have gone after Dr. King for his religion today, then you're not paying attention. Because they did the same thing to Karen Pence. They did the same thing to Mike Pence, her husband. And they're saying because she signed an oath saying that she was a Christian and she believed these things, that she's somebody that should be cast out of polite society. They would have done the same thing to Dr. King. The exact same thing. Because to Dr. King, there was nothing more important than making sure that his movement was based in the scripture, based in the Bible, and the principles that it taught. I think when you look at that evidence that I've just presented, there is absolutely no doubt that if you're looking at the two and you have to make a comparison and you make a call, there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that Dr. King would have been far more at ease and far more at home in the March for Life than he would have been anywhere near the Women's March. Now, I know you're here because you're interested in information on what's going on in the state of Alabama and around the world, and you've come to the right place for that. But it's YouTube, so you could also just be here because you're bored. If you want me to keep making videos to keep you occupied, you need to go ahead and like and subscribe. Otherwise, you're going to have to go back to playing Minesweeper.